Center Point family, it's Sunday morning and you're getting ready to worship. And as we worship together virtually today, there's a sermon that Brother Jerry preached on October the 11th at our note burning ceremony about fear. It's a very appropriate sermon for the time in which we live. I'm grateful for Brother Jerry because he has faced many things in his life, he and Miss Linda both, that fear would have kept them from moving forward if they would have allowed it, but they didn't. They trusted God and took God at his word. And at times when things didn't make any sense and difficult situations, they stayed true to the word of God. And so as Brother Jerry preaches this sermon, we heard it already in October, but we can always hear things a second time and be encouraged by it. So I pray it'll be a blessing to you as we look back and remember that uh, the steps to take to overcome fear. Grateful for Brother Jerry and his ministry, thankful for his friendship, and I pray that you will be praying for him as he battles with COVID and uh, be a blessing to him and Miss Glenda. Hey, listen, enjoy the service. It'll speak to your heart and listen carefully. You say, well, I've listened to it before. Always listen a second time. We will learn something new. Hey, Amen. Please stand. Let's sing together. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. He who on men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength the poles. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each beast put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor's on. To him who overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. On the victory side, on the victory side, no foe can harm me, no fear can alarm me. On the victory side, on the victory side, on the victory side, with Christ within the fight will win. On the victory side. Amen. Well, we have a special treat tonight, and uh, that you can be seated. Brother Jerry is going to be coming, and he's going to preach tonight, and we are grateful uh, for his faithfulness. You know, uh, back in the early 90s, he got a vision, and the Lord led him to uh, help and uh, guide our church to this location. It was a vision that caught fire within the people, and God took the flame from his heart and put it in the heart of the people, and uh, it just took off. And, uh, you know, we moved out here, and Preacher often jokes that all these businesses around here owe him $10,000 each 
for starting the, the building in this area. Because when we moved here, there was nothing. There wasn't even a red light right here at, uh, at Old Jennings. I mean, it, there was nothing down here in those days. And so uh, we were it. As a matter of fact, in the fires of 98, and, uh, or 90, uh, the, the summer of 98, when all the fires came through, and uh, the fire department set up shop on the parking lot here at the church because they said if it gets past the church, it'll run all the way to Orange Park. And God said, 10 feet away from the gym, God said, that's it, no more. And God stopped it. And he, and he did a miraculous thing that day. And, and we are grateful for that. We're grateful for the folks of the fire rescue that were here. And uh, for those of you that were here then and all of those that have come since then, those that have come since that time, for 25 years, the church has been trying to pay off the no. And for all of that time, Brother Jerry has led us to work hard to get to that place. And so it is fitting that he would come and speak to us. Solomon writes about people who had forgotten about a man, a wise man that saved his city. What will be done to us that we should forget the person who God used to direct us? We should remember and be grateful for all that God blessed us. Not only did he bless us with Brother Jerry and instructing us financially, but spiritually from the Word of God week after week and sermon after sermon. And I have volumes of notebooks in my office of sermons that he's preached that I often go back and look at. Personally, a friend to me and uh, a great supporter for many years when I was a young kid and didn't know anything, and now that I'm an adult and know less, than I did when I was young. He's always been encouraging to me and always faithful, and I'm grateful for him, and we are appreciative for all that he has done. And we are thankful for this night. In church, I want you to know that I love you and I am grateful to you. If you had not sacrificed, if you had not stuck with Brother Jerry and stuck with the Lord, we would not be here tonight. Had you not listened and obeyed the word that you were taught, we wouldn't be here. You say, well, Billy, I remember so-and-so. I'm not interested in so-and-so. I'm interested in saying thank you for sticking. You've done a great job. This is the tool that God has blessed us with. Let us use it for his honor and glory. Preacher, are you ready? He's been ready all day. I know he keeps telling me. He, he, he said he was leaving today. He said, this hurts. He looked at me and said, but I can still preach. And so I said, I don't doubt that at all. So, preacher... Uh, my Thank you. Well, glory. I got another other side of my thing. Yeah. <clears throat> when we built these rails, never thought I'd have to use them. <laughs> I thought, well, at least. Bubba over there, the big Bubba, would use them for swinging on. And he did. Thank you for the Lord's I love you, words. Son. I love you. I can't tell you how much I love Brother Lee and David at church. They've destroyed more over my house than any other two men. Wore out more chairs than anybody else has sitting in the garage. We've had some good times there. I'm glad you came tonight. I was afraid there wouldn't be anybody here this morning after he made that announcement that I was going to preach, but I see you did come. Hey, listen. If I had my brothers, I'd rather preach on... Sin, sin, black, hell, hot, judgment, sure, heaven, say, Jesus saves and heaven sweet. But that's not the occasion tonight. I want to share something with you that I think might help you or helps, helps somebody. I experienced it helping somebody, and I won't mind sharing some of that with you. But if you listen carefully and perhaps make you some notes, 
I think it would be beneficial to you either now or in the future. I was listening to Charles Stanley this morning, and this is where I got my sermon. I'm going to speak to you on the subject of how to deal with fear. From 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 8, he was speaking about dealing with anxiety. And he concluded that anxiety and fear are basically one and the same. Anxiety comes from fearing. <clears throat> fearing that something will be found out, fearing that something will be told, fearing, fearing, fearing. Well, anyway, if you'll stand, we'll read <clears throat> that verse of Scripture. I should read all down to there, but I won't because of time. I know you're anxious to get out. And Hey, listen, would you do me a favor? As Brother Lee's talking about these people owing me $10,000, as they do. And would you meet me here in the morning with guns and help me go collect that 10000 from each place of business? I, ne I need it bad. And I want to correct him on one thing. There there was somebody out here when we came out here. It was all kind of rattlesnakes and copperheads. As big as thick as your arm, for sure. And one other thing I want to say is, when that fire came, it was burning. And as he said, it got right up to the gym here. Now here's the real miracle to that also. We had three and a half acres of pine trees back here behind this building. And it came right up to the edge of those pine trees, went right across the road to a little patch over there, spared those pine trees. God knew we needed the money. Didn't burn a one. And on Monday, we had somebody out here cutting them down, and we sold them and got them out of here just in case there was a spark came back. But that's how God works. He saved our trees for us. He's a wonderful God. Amen? For the battle was there, scattered over the face of all the country. And the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Father, I thank you for tonight and this privilege. I thank you for Brother Lee and for him allowing me to speak to the folks tonight. I love him, I love this church, and the folks that are here tonight. I ask you to use me to be a blessing, maybe just a word of wisdom or wise to help somebody, just a little bit of something that they might be able to use to come in handy to their life. I pray that they'll listen, Lord. I believe that there will be something, a nugget, that they can apply and use. I pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit power. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Perhaps I should have read all this. You can read it when you get home, but for the sake of time, I won't. But in 2 Samuel chapter 15 through 18, as you're probably familiar with, it records the heart-throbbing story of Absalom and his rebellion against his father, David. And then, of course, there's David and Absalom in a battle. And this battle is outside of Ephraim in the woods there. I mean, not in the woods, but it gets into the woods. And, of course, the woods, the forest is uh, around the uh, uh, river there, Jordan River, and uh, the Jobbik River which is in Gilead, out from Ephraim. And, of course, David is victorious in the battle, and he's told his men not to harm Absalom. And when they find Absalom hanging in a tree, uh, of course, Joab puts three darts in his heart and kills him. But something we need to notice here in this verse of Scripture, and that's what I want us to hang in on there tonight. 
simply this. And this Bible says, the forest devoured more men, more people than the sword. Now, we see right there one of the universal problems or universal emotions in humanity. You need to understand that emotion is fear, without a doubt. It means that fear terrorized the soldiers. And as a result of them being terrorized, it sent them running. And they ran right into the woods. The woods are so thick that there's no light in there. And they can't see what they're doing and what they're running into. So, but anyway, they ran into the woods, the forest, to get away from the painful reality of the battle. That's already 20,000 men is killed, but the woods kill more than the sword. Now, friend, I want you to know that that kind of fear is on almost every page of the Bible. And you might say, well, I, I don't know about that. Well, I want you to understand it is on almost every page of the Bible. Let me just give you a little inkling of it. You remember Adam and Eve? I'm sure you think about them, don't you? What, what's the first thing we find in the Genesis? We find Adam and Eve hiding. They're hiding from God. And they're hiding from God because they fear God when they're naked. So Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden because they fear God. Then the next thing we find is old Jacob. We find him leaving home. Why? Why does he take off from home? Because he fears his brother. Then, of course, we go on a little bit farther. We find Aaron, and he's forming the golden calf. Why is he forming that golden calf? I'll tell you why. Because he, he's afraid or he fears the people. Then, of course, again, there's ten spies. And the ten spies refuse to go into the promised land. Why, they go fear, why would they refuse to go into the promised land? Because they're afraid of the giants. In the promised land. Again, the word fear. And then there's, there's old King Saul. He turns into a raging paranoid. Why? Because he's afraid of David. Then we go on to Elijah. We find Elijah, that mighty man Elijah, hiding in a cave because he's afraid of one woman, Jezebel. And he wasn't even married to her. And then there's Peter. We find Peter denying his Lord three times. Why? Because he's afraid of the soldiers. And then we come to the disciples. They're huddled together behind closed doors. Why? Because they're afraid of the Jews. You see, it seems to me, as we look at the Scripture, that Fear appears everywhere throughout the Scripture. According to the biblical records, fear is one of the basic plagues of human kindness. By the way, fear has not left us. It's still with us. In our day of catastrophic change, in our day of Calamity or calamitas, I'll get it, uncertainty. In our day of our cities rioting, in our days of the streets in riots, protests, in our days of people being shot simply because they called it a peaceful protest, I'm for this and you're for that and, and somebody gets shot. In our days of a staggering world market, in our days in a nuclear threat from perhaps Russia, a nuclear threat, a threat from uh, North Korea, Iran, or perhaps North China, or maybe uh, China, I should have said, who among us tonight sitting in this building hasn't longed for a great 
hasn't longed for a forest where we can hide from the enemies on the battlefield of life. Who has it? Well, here's the question. Who in this building tonight has not known the haunting reality of fear? I can tell you I have. You say, well, you don't trust Jesus. No, whoa, don't, don't get on me that bad. You might have to jump off. You see, I believe, if you're honest, Every one of us have at some point. You see, the Bible says in verse 8, the forest devoured more men than the sword. I believe that statement is true in the life of every one of us, maybe almost every day in some folks. What do you think? Now, what is the cause of fear? We need to think about that. What is the cause of fear? Well, and we got a lot of geniuses in our world today. And we got a lot of genius organizations. We're out of question. And some of those genius organizations have developed names by which we call or label most of the common fears of life. Let me give you a few. If you're afraid of being alone, you have what? Monophobia, phobia, right? Monophobia. If you're afraid of a small place, you have what? Closet phobia. Elevator phobia. Right? If you're afraid of animals, you've got what? You have what? Zoophobia. That's right. If you're afraid of marriage, you've got what? What? Gamo, gamo, whatever you want to call it, phobia. Here's a good one. If, if, brother, if you ever get up and walk out and Brother Lee says, Why are you walking out? Stay down back there. Don't you leave this place. You can turn around and say, Well, I've got homophobia. That's when you hear sermon. You don't want to hear it. <laughs> that's, that's when you fear, you fear sermons. What about that? When you're afraid of being afraid, you have phobia, phobia. What about that? Now, the truth is, these labels aren't very helpful, are they, in determining the, determining the factors involved in the perplexing human emotions, are they? That's just some of the geniuses have named, and we have them, so I shared them with you. I thought they'd be kind of humorous. So what does cause fear? Well, sometimes fear is caused by a great imagination. Most fears are not real. They're simply imaginary. They don't exist, if you will, in objective facts, but only in subjective imagination. Well, where do fears come from it? Well, some fears can be traced to great traumas. Now listen carefully. Let me give you an example. Take a child who's been bitten by a dog in the past or as a small child, may develop a deep fear of dogs. Now, I want to tell you about a 14, 15-year-old boy. 
I was at an ice cream place one time. I don't know, a year ago or so. And I saw that boy when the dog with his mother or daddy got out of the car on a leash. That boy ran behind the building and began to cry. He was terrorized by a dog on a leash. Come to find out every time he saw a dog, he did the same thing. He would run and hide and cry. I decided to see if there's any way in the world I could ever help him. And I was able to. I'll tell you about that later. Or let's, let's take a person. A person that's been hurt in a serious dating relationship may develop a fear of the opposite sex. A person that's almost drowned may develop a fear of water. There are other fears, and they find root in the mysteries of life. You remember when the angels announced the birth of Jesus Christ? You remember the shepherds were afraid? Luke 2, 9. Do you remember the disciples were afraid when Jesus walked to them on water? Matthew 14, 26 to 27. Do you remember that fear clutched them all when Jesus robbed death of the son of the wit of the name and restored him to life? Luke 17, 16. Do you remember that they were afraid and they begged Jesus to depart, leave, get away from them? When he, <laughs> when he tamed a wild man, the Gadarene demoniac, and he let the tame pigs and turned them into wild pigs, and they didn't have any sense to run over, slipped into the river. Luke 8, 37. Do you remember... In Acts 2.43 at Pentecost, when fear came on the, all the crowd, when they began to see strange signs and hear strange sounds. You remember that? So fear can be traced to great traumas. Fear also can be caused by great responsibilities. Now, in Numbers chapter 13, you say, preacher, this is not preaching, this is a lecture. Take it for what it is. It's free. No, it may not be you paid off the debt. Numbers 13, the Israelites were afraid. Why? Because they didn't feel adequate to the responsibility that God had put on them to enter into the promised land. They didn't feel adequate to that. If God ever put something on you and asked you to do something, and you knew in your heart he was leading you to do something, but you didn't feel adequate to do it, And you were afraid to try it. And the reverend said this morning, God would never ask you to do something that he didn't equip you to do. First Samuel chapter 10, and he's right. I know where, I know that's right. First Samuel chapter 10 and verse 22, we find Saul. And he was afraid because of that tremendous responsibility of being king. And so he hides himself. And where do they find him? They want to anoint him king. He's hid. Where do they find him? 
They find him in the baggage room with all the rest of the dirty clothes. See, I believe one of the basic causes of fear in our life today is personal inadequacy in the face of great responsibility as Absalom was. You say, Absalom? Yes. Absalom felt inadequate for the job. You see, listen, young people. I want you to know there's a responsibility for all young people. That responsibility is adjusting the society and relating to our peers and becoming acceptable. There's going to be an adjustment as it is. And then adults, there's a responsibility of meeting our family obligations. My Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. There's a responsibility of meeting our obligations, our family obligations. Now, I know during this time of <coughs> COVID, some people don't have a job, and that's what they're taking care of. They're feeding people, and that's a good thing, feeding people, helping people. But there's a responsibility for adults of meeting our obligations and succeeding in our work and leaving our mark on life. Amen? When I go, I hope I've left a mark. I often look back and wonder if I ever accomplished anything. <clears throat> life is filled with responsibilities, isn't it? It is. And because we feel so inadequate for the job, what do we do oftentimes? We just shrink back in fear, don't we? Is that right? So the cause of fear. But it, it comes with a curse. So what is the curse of fear? Now, don't misunderstand what I've just said. All fear is not a curse. Some fear is a blessing. You see, did you know that fear is behind every human achievement? in this world. Now you think about what I just said. Fear is behind every human achievement in the human race. Huh. You know, when I drive down Moody, either way I go, it gives me a fit at certain times because there's schools, public schools. And 40, 100 people parking on the highway and trying to get on the highway and get off the highway. Did you know all across America we got a public school system? Do you know all across America we got colleges? You know, we're trying our best to educate people in America, aren't we? And we're failing compared to other people. Do you have any idea what led to public schools? We have public schools because we had a fear of ignorance. A great human achievement because of fear of ignorance. You know why we have medical research? You know why we got a doctor for everything, including your gizzard? There's every kind of doctor in the world. You know why? Because the fear of disease. You know what, what, about, what brought about electricity? In fact, let me tell you a story. Last Friday night, Friday night, we go. 
We come home. We came home from a five week trip. Five week trip with the Lord. You can laugh about that if you want to. To a dark house, eight thirty at night. No electricity. Don't know how long it's been off. Completely dark. Can't get in. Can't do nothing. Finally get Clay Electric out there about 10.30. I think it was a little portable battery, it looks like. Plug it into the meter. Get some temporary electricity. The line on the driveway is broke. Go in the house. Open the freezer. freezer. They're cold as ice. No electricity. God's miracle was is a little line still had some electricity on it. It went to the refrigerator and the freezer. No other electricity in the house. Stayed on that temporary little old battery for a week or two. Finally got some electricity. But you know what led to electricity? Fear of darkness. Just sit out there in your driveway in the dark, waiting. Fear of expo exposure is what led to building homes. Fear at its best, at its best cause at its best, causes us to put forth new energies. As a result of that, it's what produces life's greatest achievements and protects us from life's greatest hazards. Fear does. Let me give you a biblical example of that. Sometimes you want to read about positive power of fear. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 7. Now listen. Fear becomes a curse when we let our Initial reaction escalate into the fear spiral. The curse of fear is when it takes control of your life. It'll immobilize you in the face of the great responsibility of your life. Immobilize you. Listen to me right now. There is no emotional force in life that's so able to make you do what you ought not to do and to leave undone what you ought to do like fear at its worst. Make you do what you ought not to do and to leave undone what you ought to do. Fear will do that. I am talking the kind of fear that makes you run into the woods instead of run in standing still and fighting the enemy like you ought to it's a curse why because it paralyzes your life and when it does it makes you ineffective it makes you unproductive as a servant of god cause of fear curse of fear you gotta be a cure for it just stay with me folks i'll finish up here in a minute i know you're tired what is the cure for fear Listen to me. What can you do about it? Let me give you four cures for fear. I know they work because I've seen this young man go from going to virtual school to taking six classes a day, to being in the top six in his class, to eating popcorn chicken three times a week in school, to being normal again petting dogs, everything in this world that you can think of that he was afraid of before. It works. Let me give you four years of fear. Now, this is worth writing down. You came here, you sit your nickel, write this down. My mouth is dry as a powder house. Here you go. Number one, confrontation. Confrontation. The first antidote for the cure of fear is confrontation. You will have to confront your fears. That's all there is to it. When you confront your fears, then what I would have you to do is to separate your fear experience from the fear object. Separate your fear experience from the fear object and you'll find out that most of your fears are unfounded 
are ungrounded. Separate them. In 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt said this, We have nothing to fear but fear itself. That motto was a reminder that you never overcome your fears by running into the woods. You overcome your fears by facing them head on in the battlefield, and when you do that, most of your fears will just disappear. You've got to face them. That boy couldn't, pay, couldn't, couldn't pet a dog. He had to face that dog. He couldn't eat in the lunchroom. He had to eat in the lunchroom. He had to go to the lunchroom. He couldn't go to school. He had to go to school. He couldn't do this. He couldn't do that. He had to do that. He'd call me every morning at 630. I'd have prayer with him. He'd call me every afternoon. I'd question him about school. I'd have prayer with him. Call me the next morning. I'd go over the notes that I gave him, these notes that I'm trying to give to you. You don't want them. He took them. He applied them in his life, changed his life. And I'd pray with him every day, every day. Pray with him. Pray with him. Why? So he could establish his confidence in God Almighty. Number two, cure for fear, compassion. See, I don't know what compassion makes in this preacher. Don't get too far gone now. If you want to make application of this and use it, use Scripture, you can use 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32, and that'll make you an outline. In the New Testament, if you look at it, you'll find fear and compassion are often interwoven. Interwoven. Let me give you an example. John wrote this. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. Amen? And that's the love of God. Now, here's a question. What does love have to do with fear? Can you imagine that? Why is compassion an antidote to fear? Why is compassion an antidote to anxiety? Well, I'm going to tell you. The answer is simply this. Because one of the main curses, causes of fear is self. It's the main cause of fear right here. You see, self-love, one. Two, self-concern, three. Self-centeredness. Four, self-protection. Self-love, self-concern, self-centeredness, self-protection. You see, folks, fear comes when you look at other people with a question, what will he do to me? Fear comes when we have this question, what will he think of me? How many times have you come to church or going to some party or going to some place where everybody was kind of a little bit up to do or whatever, and you say, well, I wonder what they'll think of me. Self-concern. Fear comes most often in a life that's focused on who? Self. On self. But the good news is love will change your focus. Here's how it does it. Love causes us to look at others, doesn't it? Sure it does. And when we look at others, what do we do? We say, what can I do for him? What can I do for her? Have you ever seen a mother who's deathly afraid of fire, a house fire, building fire, any kind of fire like that? Here it is. She's rescued out of a flaming, burning home. They get her outside and just barely save her, save her life. And after she's outside, and they tell her one of her kids is still inside that building, she turns around, and she runs back into that building. They try to keep her out, but she runs back into that building, into that flaming house, she gets that child, and she brings him out because she's going to rescue the child she loves. Why? Love makes her forget. 
love makes our beginner self for the sake of others or for the sake of that child that she loves. Amen. Will that not work? You've seen that on the news, I'm sure. If we're bothered by fear, my dear friend, we need to turn our focus from ourselves to somebody else or something else that so that you don't have to have time to focus on yourself. Too many people got too much time to focus on their self. Get busy. Do something. Brother Lee's got plenty of work for you to do. The first antidote is what? 1 Samuel 17, 26, confrontation. I hope you get these four down. You, you, you can help somebody sometimes. And those people need help. The second note is what? Compassion. First Samuel uh, 17, 32. The third antidote is what? I got the back of it. Courage. First <laughs> Samuel 17, 45, 46. Hey, hey, listen. Courage does not deny the reality of fear. Courage recognizes the reasons for fear. But courage refuses to be immobilized by fear. You know what courage is? It's the ability to act in spite of the fear. Folks, all my life I've been afraid to do things. I'm an introvert whether you know it or not. And you say, I don't believe that. I don't give a rip whether you do or not. I'm an introvert. Always have been. I'm always worried about what people thought, whether I was dressed properly or not, or this, that, and other. I was in the grocery business. I'd rather be back there unloading the truck in the stock room, taking those cans out of boxes, putting them in, marking them, putting them in the shelf out there, and doing that kind of stuff, mopping and sweeping floor. You said, but you own the store. Yeah, but I didn't have to go up to the cash register and the cash register and meet all them people. Why? Because I was introverted. Constantly, constantly. You said, I, well, how did you get to preach? The guy hand me, hand me stuff. Hand me a, I got saved and the guy handed me a, a Keys to an old bus, and he said, "Go fill that bus up and bring them in here, and you can start talking about the Bible." Well, I didn't, I didn't know where to draw. I didn't know nothing. I just got saved, and I didn't know anything. Did I? Is it all? I didn't know a thing, did I, Splendor? No, sure didn't. I knew more about hell than I did about anything else, because I was a hell raiser. But it, I didn't. I felt like about two thirds in the wind. And I wasn't no more introvert. I was a whole lot outward. So somebody knocked your block off. But anyway, see, we all got, we got fear. How do you handle fear? Courage. How do you get up here and preach? You say, does it bother you? Yeah, I've got butterflies now. It takes courage. You just go ahead and go on and get out there and refuse to be immobilized by fear. Right? Courage is the ability to act in spite of fear. Amen? You ever have a problem with that, Brother Lee? Sure. If you don't, you got a problem. Trouble, fear, is reality in every life. Pain, folks, is an ever threatening possibility, right? Sure it is. The challenges of life are constantly frightening situations in your life and my life. Just remember this. I'm going to get out of here. Courage is the ability to act in spite of fear. So how can we do that? Where do we get that kind of courage? We find our answers right here in these four antidotes. Antidote one? What is antidote one? Now, I like for everybody to say it that knows it. What's that in the one? Oh, 
Right. Antidote two. Antidote three. Antidote four. They got there yet. Confidence. Confidence. You can put first Samuel seventeen and four times forty six to that if you want to. Where's courage come from? Confidence, but not in yourself. Never. But in the God who is with you. The God that's with you. Here's the truth. Our faith, the truth of our faith is simply this. Our God is able to overcome every obstacle of our life. Our God is able to defeat every enemy of our life. Our God's able to neutralize every threat of our life. Amen? And what does God say to his children? Fear not. Remember old Paul was over there? He was at, uh, where was he, Corinth? And he's preaching, and he's scared to death. And God comes to him, and he said, Paul, fear not. I'm with you. It turned out that, that was the second longest place that Paul preached at. Corinth, he's there a year and a half. Another place three years, another place four or five months. Yeah. I was going to say something right there. Now listen to me. One of the things I had to teach that young man was this. His confidence had to be in God, not in me, not in him but in the God who cl he claimed to be his Savior. I can do all things through Christ. Is that right? Amen? Yeah. And God says to his children, fear not. Don't worry. I'm with you. I'll help you. I'll uphold you. <laughs> I will have victory through you. Folks, listen to me. That promise permeates the whole Old Testament. And whatever God promised us in the Old Testament, he brought forward in the New Testament, and he brought it to reality in the New Testament with the coming of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now listen to me. What God did for those Christians and what he does for us is not to deny the reality of fear. <laughs> Nor does he remove all the reasons for our fear. But this is what he does. Just like my being able to stand up here. He makes us adequate to face our fear. Amen? He makes us adequate. He doesn't isolate us. What does he do? He insulates us. Sure he does. And we have the one who is life himself, planted deep within my life and deep within your life. If you're saved, and the life within us will make us adequate for the life that is around us, and the first antidote hmm, to fear is faith. Faith. You can't overcome fear without the Lord Jesus Christ in you. Let me hurry to say this to you because I want to quit here in a minute. Let me say this to you. When you put your life into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one who was, he's the one uh, who is, and he's the one who shall ever be forever. Amen? In the words of that motto, commonly heard, a generation or two ago would be true of you. You've heard it, you've said it, you've read it, you did this. Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. There was nobody there when I went and opened the door. Amen. Now close with this. Sin black. Hell lot. Judgment sure. Jesus saves. Heaven sweet. Are you going to be there? If you are, 
you can overcome anything in this world. If not, I'd like to see you right down here in a minute. And let me show you how to be saved. I would love to show you how to get He said, I don't know if you've got enough to say, show me how. Oh, don't miss, judge me. Don't make that mistake. Listen to me, folks. I gave, I said this tonight, this, this sermon, whether you like it or you don't like it, to try to help somebody in this church build. I know everyone will deal with these things. Where you think it's a good sermon, bad sermon, or a middle class sermon, I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Somebody will be helped. So don't get no heckles up. Just pray that somebody gets helped, okay? I love this boy right over here. I love that back there. I love all of you. It's these two I've raised. Thank you, Brother Lee. There's old notes that you're going to burn tonight. Started out at $23,000 a month. You don't think that won't put some fear in you? I think I'll go down with the bad, but with the good, huh? Now, folks, you have heard a sermon, and it's important that you understand something. Fear is a great motivator. And I want you to understand this. There is a fear of hell. And you should understand that there is a God who is holy and just, and he will see holiness, and he will see justice done. And as a people, we need to understand, and you need to be aware of the fact, that God demands holiness of you. You say, well, I don't think so. I'm telling you, he demands it of us. And the only way for us to have it is to have a personal relationship with Christ. And that's where we turn from our sin and accept Jesus as Lord. That's how you overcome all the fear he's talking about. Because Jesus looked at us with compassion and love and came to earth and gave himself, knowing what awaited him was Calvary, he overcame the fear because he had confidence in the plan that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit had designed to redeem man. He knew it. And he gave himself. And he faced people who hated him so that you and I could be saved. What a great God that is. I want you to stand. Brother Sherman's going to come. I'm going to pray for you. If you would like to trust Christ, you can come to the invitation. We will be thrilled to take the Word of God and show you how you can begin a relationship with Christ. And we'll take all the time. We'll sing till Jesus comes in order for you to respond. But we want you to respond. Let's pray. Father God, there are those here, Lord, that have fear. Lord, that there's fear of uncontrol, uh, different things that are going on. There's fear, Lord. Uh, this COVID business has us in fear. The election has us in fear. The outcomes have us in fear. Lord, our attention, our focus must be on you, must be on your word. And Lord, Father, the command of your word to those who believe is fear not. And to the unbeliever, fear should drive us to the one that can give us confidence and strength to face and courage to face fear. Because you had compassion, we can have it. And I pray for those that do not know Christ, that tonight would be a night of salvation for them, and that they would come and trust Christ. For believers that are struggling, Lord, may we live in accordance with your word. 
The Bible is a testimony to us of what you will do and what you have done and what you are going to do. We can have confidence in your commands. They have always succeeded and they have always brought about your will. So, Father, we trust you. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now listen, the invitation is not a time to pack up. not a time for you to check your messages. It's a time for you to do business with God. The altar's open to you. We're going to sing as we sing. If you need to come, you come. Whatever your need is, tonight you can come to the altar as we sing. Purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart, let me be as gold, pure gold, refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master ready to do your will purify my heart cleanse me from within and make me holy purify my heart cleanse me from my sin Deep within, refine as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be. Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, O oh, comforter and friend, how we need your touch again Holy Spirit rain down rain down let your power fall let your voice be heard come and change our hearts as we stand on your word Holy Spirit Folks, I love you. Preacher, thank you. Good word, folks. Hey, listen, that, that's beneficial throughout life. It's going to be a blessing to you. If you didn't get the notes, you can check Facebook later. We're going to post them on there as quick as I can get home and read my writing and get it on there. But it'll be a blessing to you. Hey, listen. We're going to go right out these doors here. Brother Ernie and those guys getting the fire ready. They've already got the wood on there. They're getting ready to light it. We're going to head out those doors. We're going to gather around there. I'm going to hand the loan paper to the preacher that shows a zero balance. And then we're going to burn it. And we're going to say to the devil, you can't have it. It ain't yours. We're going to win the lost. We're going to love people. We're going to see families restored. We're going to see people blessed. We're going to do that till Jesus comes to get us. That's what we're going to do. The devil can't have this property. He's not welcome here. We don't want him. 
We don't want him. He's not welcome. This is God's place. The bank can't threaten us anymore. Folks, I can promise you that there was fear in me when we were staring down the barrel of coming into March and having no reserves. None. We were going to be living like many people do week to week on what people gave. And you begin to think about all possibilities. How are you going to handle it? What are you going to do? And the whole time, God's working. And he's been working for a while. But you're sweating because the other side won't get it, their act together. And then the craziness of COVID comes in. And you're like, what in the world are we going to do now? And then when God steps in, in the Friday before we had to go to record the church, they sign the note, and the Monday morning we get notification from the bank that it is finished. It's just like God. He said, I'm a, you don't have enough to worry about, I'm going to take this. Amen? So that was wonderful. So if you'll make your way out there, we're going to form a circle there around that fire, and uh, we're going to be there. Now, I wouldn't leave your purse. You could probably leave your Bible because the person that would steal your purse probably not going to steal your Bible. But, I, yeah. and then when we're done there, we're going to have a prayer. I'm going to have Brother Wayne Brown pray for us. Now, what many of you don't know is Brother Wayne has given regularly, monthly, him, Miss Jody, to our debt retirement. When I shared that with him, he said, we want to be a part of that. And he, he would regularly give me a check or send us a check or go online and pay. And so I'm thankful for them. I'm going to ask him when we get out there, when we're done, uh, we're going to sing, uh, Let's Just Praise the Lord. And then we're done with that. We're going to pray. Brother Wayne will pray for us. There is a picture with a mat, a white mat around it, that has a copy of that loan statement that says zero. I want you to sign that around the mat there. And we're going to put it up in the vestibule as a testimony to what God did and the fact that you were here and were a part of honoring God tonight. So we want you to sign it. You can sign your name. You can sign your family's name. You can put your dog on there if you want to. But we want you to sign that. It's in the vestibule. If you don't get to sign it there, when we transition down to the gymnasium for ice cream and uh, cake, we want you to stay for that. They've got good stuff down there. You can be a part of that. You can have and our brother Bo, who's in heaven, you can have dessert before dinner tonight. Amen. Brother Bo was a big advocate of dessert before dinner. And so we'll do that. So let's make our way out there, and uh, we'll, we'll gather around the fire out there. Hey, good job tonight, brother.